On tonight's programme, people in Wales are tested for coronavirus as the deadly disease continues to spread. We hear from a Cardiff woman stranded in China. Well, there's been a growing anxiety, I think, just wanting to get home and get away from where you, you have a high risk. Plus, a living history. These school children meet a war veteran ahead of the 75th anniversary of VE Day. Miss Higgins is brave and, like, peeding you up. And the rugby player turned explorer Richard Parks returns to Wales after breaking his own world record. Hello there, good evening. I'm Alexandra Hartley. Testing for the potentially fatal coronavirus is now taking place in Wales. It's yet to be confirmed how many people have been tested or the circumstances around their condition. Meanwhile, in China, a lecturer from Cardiff remains stranded tonight, unable to return home as the Chinese government attempts to control the spread of the deadly virus. Our health reporter James Crichton-Smith has more. The epicentre of a virus that's spreading fast, workers are trying to build faster. By Monday, say Chinese officials, this will be a 1,000-bed facility for affected patients. But it's not been enough to stop the virus potentially reaching Wales. It's reported tonight that two people, a mother and daughter from Newport, are being tested. The news comes just a day after the Welsh Government warned there may well be people in Wales who've recently come back from the areas affected by coronavirus, but they couldn't say how many. Uh, we don't have any sense um, of the numbers. Um, as you know, there's no, um, uh, no confirmed cases in Wales or in the UK. We're working very closely with um, uh, Eng England and the public health in England and public health Wales is very closely involved. And as you know, public health um, England issue a statement at two o'clock every day. Um, and certainly we've got no more knowledge beyond that. 130 tests have already been carried out in England. All have come back negative. Meanwhile, in China, British nationals like Yvonne from Cardiff are trying to get home. All kinds of social events have been cancelled and a lot of the uh, normal gathering of people in, in, in local areas, I think, has, has stopped. So it's been very, very quiet and the only time we've been out has been to go to the local supermarket and there we've had temperature checks and everybody's wearing masks and trying, I think, to... Um, you know, adhere to the government, again, policy of the government that everybody should be masked up when they're in a public place. Um, so there's been a growing anxiety, I think, just wanting to get home and get away from where you, you have a high risk of possibility um, of infection. Yvonne's hopeful she'll be on a UK government arranged flight out of China soon. Coronavirus is from the same group of infections as SARS. Symptoms include fever, coughing and a shortness of breath. If people develop symptoms within 14 days of being in an affected area, the advice from Public Health Wales is to stay indoors and phone NHS Direct Wales. While health officials here say the UK is well prepared for the spread of viruses like this, everyone is urged to remain vigilant. James Crichton-Smith, ITV News. Well, elsewhere this evening, with just two days to go until the UK's official departure from the EU, today MEPs in Brussels approved the terms of the withdrawal. The historic vote marks the final stage of the ratification process and the end of more than three years of negotiation. Well, our correspondent David Wood is in Brussels and sent this report. It is the long goodbye they all knew was coming, but many here hoped wouldn't. And over a best of British inspired afternoon tea, pro EU British MEPs say an emotional goodbye to their foreign counterparts. None more so than Plaid Cymru's Jill Evans, Wales' longest serving MEP. She's almost finished packing up her office after 20 years in the European Parliament. It's very sad, extremely busy, and people very upset. Um, lots of people come in to say goodbye. I was still campaigning hard and had some uh, glimmer of hope that we still would have a people's vote, a final say, um, but that didn't happen. But on the other side of the building, someone is very happy to be packing up his office. Job done, definitely. 
James Wells has been one of two Brexit Party MEPs representing Wales since the summer. And while he has reservations about Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, he's happy to be getting the sack on Friday. I think um, pleased that we've achieved what we have. I think whenever you get a victory, it's very rarely you get everything you want. So, you know, we have to focus and, and look at what we have achieved rather than the things we haven't and hope that the Tories do actually stick to their word and, and do deliver Brexit as they've promised. But Wales' his only Labour MEP believes there's no hope in Brexit and didn't back Boris Johnson's deal today. Even as a candidate for the European Parliament elections and campaigning before that, uh, before 2016 and be during the referendum campaign, that I believe in the European Union and the ideals and the values that it, that it holds. I think it just will do damage to our country. And while some here believe the Brexit arguments are done and dusted, there are those who have other ideas and hope to be back in this place one day. I think Wales, I think Wales's place is within Europe and I honestly believe that Wales will be back in Europe at some point. And so the European Parliament is almost ready for Brexit. Staff were even checking the UK flag this lunchtime before it's lowered for the final time. For the next two days though, it still has a place here. David Wood reporting there from Brussels. Now closer to home, an exclusive ITV Cymru Wales poll shows historic levels of support for the Conservative Party in Wales. The poll includes the opinions of 16 and 17 year olds who will be allowed to vote for the first time in the Assembly elections next year. Figures put Labour on course to lose five seats with the Tories making the most gains. Well our political editor Adrian Masters joins us in the studio to discuss these stats in a little more detail. So Adrian what were the key findings? Uh, that things are looking bad for Labour and the Conservatives have that kind of opportunity they've long hoped for but haven't been able to achieve. Um, I should say it's a snapshot. Uh, it's not set in stone and both the parties will be working to either try to maintain it or to overturn it. But uh, just to drill down into those figures, uh, when we come to the uh, National Assembly election or the support for the parties in the National Assembly election, uh, we see the Conservatives on 35 percent, Labour on the 33 percent and plus Camry on 19% in the constituency vote. If you translate that into possible seats, what does it mean for the future Senate? Well, Labour would still be the biggest party with 24 out of the 60 seats in the Senate chamber. The Conservatives, though, look at them there, 22 seats and Plaid Cymru third at 13. That would be a remarkable turnaround. Much closer than it's ever been. And how and why do you think the Conservatives have been able to win the, over the voters? Um, because um, uh, both parties have seen big change over the last uh, few months, and particularly in December's general election. And, uh, and on that, if you look at the Westminster support, uh, if it were to happen again, let's hope there wouldn't be another general election just yet, but the Conservatives would be up slightly on December's figures at 41%. Labour would uh, be at 36%, and Plaid Cymru at 13%. That shows that the picture hasn't changed in the last month since the election, early days yet. The Conservatives will want to build on that for next year's Assembly election and for Westminster elections further down the road. And Labour will be doing all they can to turn things around. I'm sure they will. And what about the party leaders themselves? Because you've also been asking people the views on, on them. Indeed. And if they're paying attention, they should be worried because uh, three quarters of voters say uh, can't or won't say who they'd prefer as First Minister. Three quarters of voters. That's incredible, isn't it? And of the people who could be First Minister, including the one who is the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, will look at his figures, 8%. Uh, 8% 8 think Ooh. that he would make the best First Minister, and he is the First Minister. Uh, the Conservative leader doesn't fare any better. Paul Davis is on 6%. Uh, and the best performer is Plaid Cymru's Adam Price, who is cutting through a bit more, but it's still... 12%. That's incredibly low for, for all of these leaders. And the fact that three quarters of people can't or won't say who they want to be first minister is going to be very worrying, most worrying for Labour and Conservative leaders, but worrying for all of them as they try to turn around their fortunes or consolidate their gains. I guess I've got a year to do so before those elections. Adrian yeah. Masters, thanks for joining us. There's still plenty more to come on the programme. Kelsey will have the weather. Yes, and there are some rather changeable conditions over the next few days, so it may be a bit of a problem if you're making plans for this weekend. I'll have all the details in just a bit. 
And a familiar face is returning to your screens on Wales at Six. We'll be catching up with Andrea Byrne and little Jemima on how the past year has been. But first, it's exactly 100 days until the 75th anniversary of VE Day. And to mark the occasion, Second World War veterans have been visiting schools across the UK to share their wartime experiences. Here in Wales, Navy veteran Alan Higgins spoke to pupils at Pennebont Primary School in Bridgend about his involvement in Arctic convoys and the D-Day landings. Mike Griffiths went along to hear his story. That's the names of all the crew that were killed. Face to face with a man who saw so much. Alan Higgins is 96. His war memories are still vivid and he wants to share them with today's children. Well in the Navy, what was your biggest privilege and what did you miss most? You weren't that old, were you? You were a young man, very young man then. Well, I was 21 I think. I must be 18 or 21 in the Normandy landing. They asked me good questions. My ship was good, best hammocks. Oh, you know, best place I've been, the best time. They're good questions, they were, very interesting. But they understood, you know, the real, the horror of the war as well. I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't want to embellish on that, I'd know. I, there were so many sad, I'm not going to say too much, I'll start bursting into tears, of it. I will. Because they were dying as you'd taken them out. It was just mind-blowing to see how many things he went through, like leaving the ship to go out and do some army work. Very inspirational to learn things um, that I didn't know before and find out more because World War II is something that does interest me. I thought it was a, like inspirational because if there is a World War III, which will never happen, of course, um, like, he's, like, Mr Higgins was brave and like he didn't give up. This is... The very first medley made. The visit's been organised by the Royal British Legion. It wants to hear from more people who lived through the war as it prepares to mark 75 years since its end. There are some amazing stories out there and experiences and it's really important that we share these and these people have a voice and are able to use that voice in these celebrations and commemorations. How important is it to you to be coming into schools, to be doing what you've done today? Well, look, I'm a, I'm a widower now, and I liked it. And to come to see all these children, I remember uh, when I was there two or three years ago in Murmansk, talking to those Russian kids. They were marvellous. The same. Kids were the same all the world. Marvellous. Oh, he is marvellous as well. 96 years old. Incredible. Earlier this month, former Wales rugby player turned explorer Richard Parks broke his own British world record in completing a solo expedition to the South Pole. It took him 28 days battling freezing temperatures and extreme hunger. Well, he's arrived back in Wales and is with our sports reporter Beth Fisher at Cardiff Metropolitan University tonight. And Beth, I understand you're also with some of the students who helped him prepare for the challenge. Yes, we'll be speaking to them in a minute, but he had 1,150 kilometres. That's roughly the length of Britain, battling minus 40 wind chill, entirely uphill and in 28 days. And there's only one man crazy enough to do that challenge, and he's done it twice. That's former Wales international and now explorer Richard Parks. Welcome home. Cheers, Tell me man. about it. How do you feel? Uh, do you know what? I'm uh, I'm still recovering, still kind of decompressing back into civilian life, but it's just awesome to be back home. And talk to me about it, because you were going for a world record 25 days, but weather meant you had to abandon that and go for 28. Yeah, it was, uh, it, do you know what? It's, it's one of the toughest things I've ever had to do. I was on threshold, skiing 16, 17 hours a day, um, 20 days in. Uh, I realised that uh, that I wasn't going to make that 25-day target. But, you know, the project was always about more than the, the world record. Uh, it was the partnership, the legacy, the learning. And although it was a solo expedition, it was very much a team project. And kind of not letting all the people that have played a part in the project down, that's what kept me going to, uh, to break my British record. And obviously you face uh, unbelievable conditions. You've got some of your equipment here. Talk us through what you took to the South Pole. I've got kind of a bittersweet relationship with all of this now. <laughs> I think it might it might go on the fire soon but no I've got my boots uh, with the orthotics that were made by students here at Cardiff Met my flasks that uh, that were painted by the young students at Mount Stewart Primary School my skis my sleeping bag and that was my kind of sanctuary that was my my safe place my tent uh, not long I was only sleeping two three hours a night but uh, 
but it was a safe two, three hours. Yeah, and that's unbelievable. And by the end, there's pictures of you. You lost 14 kilograms, and you, and that is tough on the body, isn't it? Do you know what? It, it, uh, I, I, it would be hard for me to, to kind of pick one, but this was a tough project. And certainly in comparison to my other projects, it was just relentless. There was no margin for error, no margins. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it worked really tough, I'm really hard. I'm going to quickly talk to some students who helped you with that food. And by the end, you definitely needed it. <laughs> oh my goodness, there's not much here. Talk us very quickly about what you had to do for Richard. Well, we were given a brief from Richard to make a high calorie, lightweight product, which would suit all of his needs in the Antarctic. Um, it was a big challenge, but I think we definitely did. Yeah, and, you crushed it. And talk to me about what he was eating at the end and what he should have been eating. So he was burning in excess of 10,000 calories a day, but only consuming 7,000 due to wanting to take as minimal weight as possible. And in the last few days, only consuming 2,000 calories, which is equivalent to the products that we have here. That is unbelievable. And very quickly, Richard, it is an amazing achievement. Can you kind of have some pride about the self of what you've done? Oh, absolutely. No, I feel incredibly proud of the performance. I can't control the weather, but uh, as a performance, it was probably one of my greatest. But actually, what I am really proud of is the work that we did here at Cardiff Met and with my other partners. You know, it wasn't just about the record. It was about the learning and the legacy, too. Well, Richard, congratulations and an amazing achievement. And Alex, I don't think I could survive in Cardiff in one night, let alone the South Pole. Certainly not on that little amount of food. Beth, thank you very much to you and your guests. Now, most of them were built to commemorate soldiers who fell in the First World War, but memorial halls went on to be the focal point of many rural villages. It's unclear how many are left in Wales, but 17 memorial halls are now listed buildings. Well, as our correspondent Hannah Thomas reports, they're now used more than ever in some of our more remote communities. It's pretty and peaceful, but Pont Stickit in the Brecon Beacons is a fairly isolated village. The reservoir here was built nearly a century ago, and so was Pontstickill Memorial Hall. It's still owned and run by local volunteers, and it's one of 11,000 village halls across Britain to experience a bit of a revival. The coffee morning here brings in people from across the South Wales valleys, and the buffet is all homemade. Well, there's a decent enough spread here, that's for sure, and enjoying a cheese and onion sandwich is Jan. Um, Jan, you've been coming here for a few years now. Three years more, um, probably more. Where I'm living in Dowless, there is a community hall, but it's not like this. The desserts are certainly delicious. Well, Margaret's favourite is the trifle, and I can't say I blame her. Fantastic cakes here, Margaret. Yes. Well, all the cakes are made locally. All the girls, we do a rota. You have a chance to mix from one end of the village to the other, and outsiders come, and they face for all the people that come here. Well, Anne comes to mostly everything here. Anne, you must like it, that's for sure. I enjoy it. The company is good. Um, and otherwise I would be sitting in the house. I was talking to a lady from Aberdeer. They come from all over here. Yeah. Yes. And if people are passing, I mean, in the summer, if people pass and they're on holiday and they see the door open, you know, they come in. And they never go thirsty. Well, every week across Britain, incredibly, those who use village halls like this one munch their way through 47,000 packets of biscuits and drink 743,000 cups of tea. Not bad, eh, ladies? Cheers! But it's not just a pop-up cafe. If we lose this building, we've lost a lifeline for a lot of people in the village. We have a toddler group here, we have bingo, there's Welsh lessons, there's yoga, Mother's Union, there's so many things going on here. The hall is used practically every day of the week now. Ponies, come on! Ponies! Vic Warren is from the Campaign for the Protection of Rural Wales. His organisation doesn't want to see memorial halls closing, but changing to safeguard their future. It's, it's vital that they're usually the focus for the community. Bus routes, village shops, post offices, uh, all these sort of things are, are disappearing from, from, uh, from the rural Wales. And uh, if there's nowhere for, for, for the community to meet, then it's, you know, it falls apart, really. Nobody wants that here in Pontstickill. It no longer has a bus route, a village shop or a post office. But the people who live here appreciate its beauty and appreciate one another. 
Hannah Thomas, ITV News. You're watching Wales at Six, a reminder of tonight's top story. Testing for the potentially fatal coronavirus is now taking place in Wales. It's yet to be confirmed how many people have been tested or the circumstances around their condition. And there'll be more on this story on the evening news at 6.30. Here's Mary Nightingale. Coming up, the hundreds of Britons about to be repatriated from Wuhan, the epicentre of the new coronavirus outbreak in China, will be put into quarantine when they arrive back in Britain. We'll bring you the very latest on that. Yeah, the government takes back control of Northern after years of misery and mayhem. But what will nationalisation mean for passengers? And the new warning for women who drink when they are pregnant. Do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Now, next week, Andrea Byrne will be returning to present Wales at Six after a year away on maternity leave. Well, earlier, she popped into the studio to pay us a visit with little Jemima, who will be turning one next month. I started by asking her how the last year has been. It has been absolutely wonderful. Yes, this is Jemima. Absolutely wonderful to be able to, you know, spend time, so much time with her in the, you know, in the first few months of her, of her, of her life. And it has just flown by though. She's very chatty. She has you become chatty. <laughs> I think she's trying to tell you that during tea time and bedtime, she's been very much enjoying watching Wales at six. Well, oh, she's an avid viewer, being, is she? Yeah, she's one of, a, one of Wales at six's youngest new fans. <laughs> And we've been watching a lot of Piers and Susanna. It's been up very early in the morning. So good oh. morning, Britain, as well. So. True fans. Well, she's obviously loving the telly because she was very calm before and now she's definitely showing off her singing skills and uh, her dance moves. <laughs> but she is, as you say, she, she's nearly one. She's one in just a couple of weeks' time. And it's just, it, it just has gone... <laughs> <laughs> it's gone very quickly. Oh, and, uh, you are well, a character. <laughs> well, I turned around, talking of, you know, characters, I turned around yesterday morning, I think, and she'd found the dog food bowl. So that was an interesting moment. Um, and um, I've been one of those mums in the supermarket car park that you think you're never going to be. And then you've got trying to get the stroller back into the car. And you do need a physics degree, don't you, to be able to collapse some of those strollers and put them in the back in the car. Everybody's staring at me. I thought I'm going to have to call somebody else to put <laughs> some kind of huge van to be able to put, put it back in. Um, so we've had those moments like I'm sure all parents do um, but you know she's to us she's just um, absolutely um, magical it's been a magical chaos at times but um, you know for us it was a bit of a difficult journey to, to have her as well um, everyone's got their sort of unique journeys to parenthood but ours was quite complicated so we just remind ourselves during those crazy moments of, um, of those things really as well. Absolutely. And how are you feeling about coming back? Uh, yeah, so Monday. I'm back on Monday. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I, I, I've, it's nice to kind of um, look forward to having that other part of me back as well and um, getting back into the stride of work. Obviously going to miss her absolutely dearly. Will she be tuning in? <laughs> well, obviously that is, is, is kind of tea time, bedtime, as I was saying. So, yeah, I'm quite excited to know whether she recognises me when, when I'm on at six o'clock. It'd be quite strange, really, to know what it's like for her watching me she's obviously very excited about it <laughs> she is excited about it yeah and and, uh, and has lee enjoyed oh yes um thank you for reminding me because we have to wave to daddy because if we don't wave to daddy and everybody watching the family will get told off so um we're, we're gonna give a give a little wave give a little wave aren't we <laughs> yeah. oh, i think the lights are fascinating oh, at the moment oh, well, you are a star oh, in the making wow. jemima thanks very much for coming and we'll see you on monday <laughs> thank you very much thanks alex <laughs> Sadly, Jemima won't be joining us on Monday. She was quite a character. Time for a look at the weather now. And Kelsey joins me in the studio. Kelsey, some quite wintry weather we've been having. Yes, we definitely have. We've had some typical wintry conditions, but also some weather for ducks, you might say. But for one man, it's always the weather for ducks. Yes, Eric Bayliss from Clamberis has been feeding them every day for the last six years. So much so that they even recognise his van when he turns up. Ian Lang has been to meet him and his feathered friends. Every day, come rain or shine, at 4.30pm, the ducks and swans of Thin Padan can depend on Eric Bayliss for a free meal. And so familiar is the sight of Eric feeding his feathered friends that he's now known as the duck man of Llanberis. As for the ducks, well, they gather as soon as they see him getting out of his van, knowing supper is on hand. 
Yeah. How, how do you feel about being called the Duck Man at Lamberis? Oh, that was a bit, uh, bit off, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what about yeah. a, duck, a Duck Whisperer? Oh, well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's a pleasure to do it, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Four thirty every day. They're here, are they? Uh, well, yeah. Well, they're here every day. To be honest, uh, just that I come at that sort of time when I. But they recognise you, you reckon? Well, I think they recognise the van and the and the bucket. To be honest. Eric might well cry foul if you said his contribution to the community of Llanberis was simply feeding ducks. From planting bulbs to picking up litter, he is a bit of an unsung community hero, doing his bit and loving every minute of it. But what does Mrs Bayliss make of it all? I went with him one day because I didn't believe him. And as soon as we pulled up by the lake, I sat in the van and they all came trotting up uh, to meet him with his bucket and uh, wanting food. Yeah, I'm very proud of him. Uh, he's doing lots for the village. I'm very proud of him, yes. And the well-fed ducks at Lynn Paran would certainly agree that he fits the bill. Ian Lang, ITV News, Llanberis. Those ducks are well looked after. They are. But the question is, do we have good weather for feeding the ducks? I'm glad you said good weather for feeding the ducks because it definitely is weather for ducks. Uh, I mean, for Eric, it's feeding ducks weather every single day. Not too bad anyway. But yes, it is some rather changeable conditions for us over the next few days. A bit of wet and windy weather to come. So let's take a look at what's in store for us over the next few days. Here's the forecast. Let's go. Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV Cymru Wales weather. Well, it's been a rather blustery day, especially across western coasts. However, whilst the winds will ease over the next 24 hours, it's still going to be a rather cloudy picture, I'm afraid, with a few bits and pieces of drizzle at times too. But at least it will be feeling milder, so not quite as chilly and as cold as it has been recently with that cold spell. So tonight then, it is going to be a rather cloudy night to come. We will see a few bits and pieces of drizzle where we do have quite a bit of low cloud, but it's not going to be a cloudy night for all of us. We will start to see some clear skies developing at times for some of us, perhaps a little bit of coastal fog lingering in places too, but a much milder night compared to what we've had recently. So no worries of any frost, a frost-free night to come. And a bit of a north-south split as far as the temperatures are concerned. So you can see that the further north you are, the chillier things may be. But however, with all this southwesterly milder airflow, you can see that we do have some overnight lows for some of us and to 8 Celsius, so not bad at all. A frost-free start to your morning. However, with a bit of coastal fog and fog lingering around, it is going to be a rather murky, dull grey start to your day, I'm afraid. Quite a lot of cloud around, not much in the way of brightness, I'm afraid. And where we do have that low cloud, we could see quite a bit of drizzle too. But as I mentioned, temperatures starting to pick up a little bit with this milder southwesterly airflow. You can see temperatures double figures across the boards tomorrow, so it's not going to be feeling too chilly out there. And the winds do ease back a little bit, but still a little bit on the breezy side. But now let's take a look at what's in store for us on the weekend anyway. The best day at the moment, if you are making plans for anything, is definitely on Saturday. Some rather changeable conditions, but at least things stay in rather mild for this time of year. Temperatures above average. Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV Cymru Wales weather. So yes, yeah, Saturday definitely looking like the best day of the weekend, which is good news for the rugby if people are heading out and about. But the question is, will the roof be on or off of the Principality Stadium? Watch this space, I think. Watch this space indeed. Kelsey, thanks very much. And just before we go, don't forget to check out our website to see the latest news from around Wales, including why fans are disappointed despite Gavin and Stacey picking up a national television award last night. Ruth Jones accepted the award from Ollie Mers and Sir Tom Jones in character. All right. Oh, Ollie. Yes. What's the mood in? <laughs> I don't know what you're laughing at, Tom. You never write, you never phones. <laughs> There's still a lot of electricity between me and Sir Tom. Brilliant. Congratulations to them. And that is it from us. I'll be back with your next update after news at 10. Until then, bye-bye from us.